being cut up for scrap was every engine's worst nightmare. But the fear of becoming scrap differed in strength from engine to engine. And one job in particular that most engines hate was taking loads of scrap metal to the scrapyard or simply working there, shunting lines of trucks to either be filled with scrap or taken to a smelting shed to be melted down. The mainland would also send withdrawn engines to Sodor for scrapping in a dead train. This was usually done after nightfall so that the island's resident engines wouldn't have to bear witness to such a grisly sight. However, this wasn't always the case for one particular engine, a dark blue well tank by the name of Sunny, dreaded the scrapyard more than any other engine. Before his arrival on the island of Sodor, Sunny was under the ownership of two thieves named Baz and Bernie, who used him to travel around and steal valuable goods. Now he found himself working on the Northwestern Railway for Sir Totten Hat, doing his best to prove he was trustworthy, but most importantly, really useful. One evening, Sonny was resting in his shed when Sir Totten Hat came to see him. Evening, Gulp, Sonny said with a smile. Good evening, Sonny, Sir Totten Hat replied. I have a job for you. Sonny beamed happily. What sort of job, Gulp? He asked curiously. Ari and Bert need some help with the workload tonight at the Kildane Smelter's Yard, Stratman told Sonny. Even though the two can manage the smelter's yards well on their own, there is a high demand for scrap metal at this point in time. Can I trust you to help them? Sonny's face fell a little bit. A feeling of uncertainty came to his boiler. Of course, said Sonny, his voice a little shaky. You'll be fine, Sonny, Stratman said soothingly. I have told every bird that you are coming to help them and nothing more. I understand you were threatened to be scrapped when those two crooks owned you. But that's all behind you now, okay? Sonny didn't reply, but left off a feeble wish of steam. Can I trust you to do a good job there for just tonight? Strumman asked. Uh... Yeah, 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 of course, Gulp. You can rely on me, said Sonny. So Tamad could hear the uncertainty in the well tanked voice, but knew he couldn't let him down. All right, then, said Stratmat. Best you get going, so you can be there before nightfall. And with that, Sir Tamad walked away. Sonny watched him walk off until he was out of sight. With that, Sonny set up at the smelter's yard. But deep inside, there was a dormant feeling of dread. Overhead, the sun had set up and twilight was closing in as Sonny made his way down the main line to the smelter's yard. The trip felt like it took hours. But at long last, Sonny had arrived. The eerie sight of rusty scrap and the remains of engines made Sonny feel a little uncomfortable, as any engine would be. But his feeling of discomfort was much stronger than most. A thin mist hung low to the ground and the distant sound of machinery hard at work made the atmosphere more eerie. Sonny came to a stop and looked around. There were trucks lined up waiting to either be filled with rusted scrap metal, emptied in the smelter shed, or to be shunted onto an unwaiting line of trucks ready to be taken elsewhere on the island or the mainland. As his eyes darted about the place, a sickening feeling rose in Sonny's boiler as if he got boiler ache all of a sudden. It felt like someone had taken his boiler tubes and twisted them into a knot. Just then, the distant sound of purring was heard in the distance. Sonny looked ahead, and from the low, lying mist emerged the two ironworks diesels. Evening, said Harry. You must be Sonny. So time I told us you were coming to help, eh? Sonny didn't reply for a bit, but plucked up the courage. Yeah, that's right. The gov sent me here to assist you, said Sonny, trying his best not to sound scared. Arian and Bert chuckled a little. Don't worry, Sonny, came Bert's reply. If you had your scrap, the gov... 
the Gov would mount our engines on this wall. <laughs> You've got nothing to worry about. Sunny eyed the Ironworks twins closely. Their demeanor was menacing, but they meant no harm. They knew they had a job to do, and dreaded what Sir Thomas would say if the work wasn't done. To him, Sonny felt like a helpless deer staring in fear at Ari and Bert, who were like two hungry wolves staring down their prey, waiting for a chance to strike. Just don't try anything silly, please, Sonny said sheepishly. The twins looked at each other and chuckled again. We won't, Ari replied. Mind how you go. The smelter yard's foreman was approached them. Ah, you must be the engine so Topham had sent to help Addy and Bert. Sonny, was it? The foreman said. Yeah, Sonny, that's me. He replied, a stint of hesitance in his reply. All right then, your first task for tonight is to marshal the empty liner trucks just behind Addy and Bert over to that siding so they can be loaded by that crane over there, the foreman told Sonny. Sonny looked behind Bert and saw the trucks the foreman had mentioned. No problem, Gov, said Sonny. Even though he was trying not to, Sonny was struggling to hide his unease. Better get to work now, said Bert. Can't disappoint the Gov, eh? Can't have that. We would be seen as useless scrap. Sonny gulped a little. Yeah, yeah, can't disappoint the Gov. I better get started, he said with a tremble in his voice. And with that, Sonny set off to work. It took a bit for Sonny's crew to switch him onto the same line as the trucks. But once it was done, Sonny found himself approaching them. Though what Bird said to him earlier was only said out of harmlessness, Sonny was taken a bit aback by this, even though Bert was being serious. They couldn't help stand to disappoint Chop had, let alone be considered useless. He carefully bobbed up to the trucks and began to push them over to a small crane on the side of the tracks. By now, the twilight had given way into an endless void of darkness and love, as cool and crisp breeze could be felt in the wind. But in the air, Sonny could feel the distant and humid heat of the smelting shed, as well as hearing the sound of heavy machinery working hard, breaking down the scrap metal to be used again. The cool night air did nothing to bring Sonny some comfort as he marched his trucks into line, but soon stopped. He watched as the crane groaned to life and turned around. Its giant claw grabbed under pieces of rusty scrap metal. Small dust trails and bits of rust and metals fell as the crane lifted the scraps to be loaded onto Sonny's trucks. While this was going on, Sonny was deep in thought he low with being considered useless, as that was a word he had come to hate so passionately. I'm not useless, Sonny muttered to himself as his trucks continued being loaded with scrap. After the last truck was loaded, Sonny pushed the now loaded trucks into a siding where they would wait until they would either be pushed into the smelting shed or loaded onto a train to be taken somewhere else. That singing feeling continued to bother Sonny, and now a mild but not overbearing sense of dread began to rise within him. Sonny swallowed hard and tried his best to forget all what had happened when he was a thief. As he shunted another line of trucks, he passed by Bert, who was making his way back to the junction where Sonny had arrived a couple hours before. Sonny didn't make any eye contact with him at all and continued on with his work. Bert stopped next to his brother as they watched Sonny pop back and forth. Goodness me, said Harry. Look how focused he is, Bert. Not even stopping for a minute to catch his breath. I never seen a steamy focus so closely on their work. Wonder what gives him the motivation to do so. The twins looked at each other as they pondered why. Sonny was busting around like he was. No idea, Bert, Harry said to his brother. But we'd best leave him to it. Better safe than sorry. A bit later, Harry and Bert were taken on fuel when the foreman walked up. There's a train of scrap that needs to be brought here to be unloaded. It's at Crot's scrap yard. Ridge will have the trucks before you arrive. Can you do it? The foreman spoke to the twins. No problem, said Harry in an oily voice. Easy peasy. We'll make it there and back at a jiff. Thank you, the foreman replied. After you're done fueling up, please make your way there. So you can manage the workload for a little while. Very well, Gov, said Harry. And with that, the foreman walked away, the ballast crunching with every step he took. After the twins had refueled, they made their way to the smelter's entrance. Sonny was just finishing shutting some trucks into his sign, and when he saw Harry and Bert nearing the entrance, he called out to them. Oi! Why are you, where are you two heading off? Gotta pick up a train of scrap from Kron's scrapyard, replied Harry. 
It won't take long. You can manage for right now. Take care, and be mindful not to take up the science reserved for the dead train, said Bert. Keep on your guard. Strange things unknown happen around here. When the two ironworks diesel set up for the night, Sonny watched until the two diesels tail lamps had vanished into the darkness, and the sound of their engines faded away. Sonny continued to marshal lines of trucks, either empty or loaded around the yard. He felt a bit uneasy without area burnt around. Not even the presence of his crew could ease the discomfort of being alone in a place where he felt he didn't belong. After some of the trucks were in their proper sightings, Sonny headed over to the water tower to get a drink. As his fireman lowered the spout into the open cap of his water tank, Sonny took a deep breath and let out a slow but heavy sigh. He breathed slowly as he felt the cool water enter his water tank. Just then, the sound of footsteps was heard as the smelter's foreman went up to Sonny. Since Addy and Bert need to go and fetch a train of scrap, I need you to shunt some loaded trucks into the smelting shed so the scrap can be melted down and repurposed. Oh, um, sure thing, Sonny said softly. The foreman nodded and walked away, leaving Sonny alone with his crew once more. Once he had his drink, Sonny uh, got himself turned around so that he was facing the smelting shed. He looked ahead and saw the trucks that were waiting to be shunted. As he approached them slowly, that awful pit-like feeling in his boiler worsened, almost to the point where he wanted so desperately to run out of the smelter's yard and empty out the contents of his ash pan. But Sonny knew that the work had to be done. Swallowing hard once more, Sonny buffered up to the trucks and began to slowly push them into the smelting shed. As he drew closer, the heat from within became warmer and the sounds of rumbling machinery grew louder. The ominous red glow enveloped Sonny as he crossed the threshold. Once Sonny's bunker had cleared the doorway, the large double door slowly closed behind him. The only way out now shut until another engine needed to get in. Sonny felt trapped a little. The heat from the smelting pot was now warmer than before, almost like it could choke Sonny with its sweltering humidity. His crew mopped their foreheads as their engine continued to push the trucks towards the smelting pot. Sonny could feel a little bit of sweat trickling on his forehead and the bridge of his nose. He panted slightly to cool himself down, but it did nothing. Soon, the first truck was under the grabber that hung like a large metal spider from the ceiling. Sonny looked up as the grabber lowered itself to take the contents of the first truck and dumped them into the waiting smelting pot. The orange and golden glow from the smelting pot shone in Sonny's eyes, almost blinding him. He closed his eyes and did his best to wait while the first truck was unloaded. The steady bubbling of the smelting pot made it sound like a giant cauldron just beginning to feed delicious rusted scrap. Sonny listened closely as the scrap from his truck was dumped into the smelting pot, the slag splashing and the hissing of the metal as it melted into nothing. The sound made Sonny feel a little sick to his boiler. As he pushed the second truck into position, a distant voice began to call out from the deepest void of Sonny's mind, a rather familiar voice. The voice echoed in Sonny's smoke box and reverberated in his funnel. Sonny darted, his eyes trying to find the owner of the voice, but there was no one there except his crew, a few workers and the grabber's operator. Who's there? Stammered Sonny, more sweat beginning to run down his face and within his boiler. Sonny felt his heart pound like a beating drum. The voice rang out again, only this time it was closer. This is just beyond your game boys. It didn't take Sonny long to realize that the voice in his head belonged to Baz, the man who threatened Sonny to be scrapped if he didn't help them steal. He began to pant and his heart was now beating faster than before, like he was running at full speed on the main line. Sonny wanted to yell, but his voice was lost deep in his throat. Baz's voice rang out of the smoke box, humming around in Sonny's mind like an angry swarm of bees. Everywhere was clear as day, and the insults and threats stung Sonny from within. This is the beyond your game, Morrison. He's a good sign. He uses essential. Listen here, thank you, Josh. The words continued to swarm around Sonny's funnel and smoke box, and they just wouldn't stop. Sonny shut his eyes tight. Just as he pushed the last truck under the grabber, he clenched his teeth as drops of sweat dripped from his face and onto his running board. It took a bit, but Sonny found his voice at last. Stop. He mumbled under his breath. L -l -l Leave me alone. I I'm not useless. I'm not a clanking clock. Now his heart felt like it was about to burst out of his boiler as it thumped harder and faster. 
Though his eyes were closed tight, Sonny could feel the sting of tears from beneath his eyelids. The voice echoed louder than before. This is Beth Beyond the Girl Game Boy. This is Beth Beyond the Girl Game Boy. This is Beth Beyond the Girl Game Boy. At last, Sonny could bear it no longer. He pushed the trucks in front of him hard, and they rolled down the track for a little bit before coming to a stop. Hey! Who told you to push your weight around? The trucks protested. But their protests were drowned out in Sonny's mind as he continued to fight internally against this hellish swarm of repressed memories. Please, just stop! Sonny protested, his voice beginning to crack. I'm not a thief anymore. You can go to hell for all I bloody care. Just leave me alone, leave me alone! Sonny's yelling echoed around the smelting shed, but was quickly drowned out by the sound of machinery. A couple of workers stopped their work and turned in Sonny's directions. Even Sonny's crew began concerned when the needle in Sonny's steam pressure gauge moved. That's strange, his fireman said. What is it? his driver asked. His steam pressure is rising a little, Sonny's fireman inquired. Both men stared at each other, and they tried to figure out what was wrong with their engine. Please, stop holding me and leave me the hell alone! A couple of tears squeezed their way from under Sonny's closed eyelids and ran down his sweaty cheeks. The noise of the smoking pot and the smoking shed quickly faded as Sonny began to shudder. Sonny, what's the matter? His driver called. What's gone into you? But no reply came as Sonny ignored his driver. Shut up, Baz. You're not my owner anymore. You have no control over me anymore. Just leave me alone. Sonny's steam pressure rose a bit more. His crew eyed his gauges, prayed to whatever god could hear them that Sonny's safety valve wouldn't burst. Then the doors to the smelting shed opened, and the familiar sound of these legends humming made itself known. Ari and Bert looked ahead and saw Sonny shuddering violently. Breaking through the deafening echoes of Baz's dastardly voice came another. Sonny! 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 Sonny opened his eyes wide and let out a loud gasp. His crew breathed a sigh of relief as Sonny's steam pressure went down. Ari and Bert approached. Uh, now, why are you under the grabber then, Sonny? That's usually reserved for the scrap trucks or engines from the dead train. Ari asked him. Sonny wanted to reply, but once again, his voice got lost deep in his throat. The ironworks twins rolled up alongside and could see from the blinding glow of the smelting pot the shivering tracks of sweat that dampened Sonny's face. His obsidian pupils had contracted into small little pinpoints. A lump had formed in his throat. Sonny tried his best to swallow it down, but it wouldn't budge. A few more tears escaped his eyes. Ari and Bert remained respectfully silent. As much as they wanted to ask Sonny what was wrong, they could hear Sonny almost silently whippering under his breath. Come on, Bert. Let's get Sonny out of here. Ari said to his brother. Ari backed up and switched himself onto the same line as Sonny. Once he buffered up, he and Bert slowly reversed out of the smelting shed, fear stricken, but almost mentally charged Sonny following close. Once out of the smelting shed, Ari and Bert brought Sonny to the entrance where the foreman was waiting. Thank you very much for your help, Sonny, he spoke to him. I'll inform Sir Top Matt of your hard work tonight. He will be most pleased to hear you've done well to manage during the short time Ari and Bert were absent. Sonny said nothing and stayed deathly quiet. Ari uncoupled himself from Sonny and cleared the line so Sonny could turn himself around and leave. Once he was, Sonny didn't say goodbye to Ari and Bert. Instead, he left quietly, tears still streaming down his face. The two diesels watched until Sonny's figure disappeared into the dark night. They were at a loss for words. They couldn't wrap their buffers around why Sonny was under the grabber and shaking violently. What do you suppose got into him? Bert asked. I reckon some bad memories resurfaced, perhaps. Ari answered back, but I digress. Bert just grunted in agreement. But little known to the two ironworks diesels, Ari would be right. Soon, Sonny returned to the yard where his shed was situated. It took some time to get Sonny turned around, where he could easily back into his shed for the night. Once bunkered down in his warm shed, Sonny's fireman doused his fire. Both men were still concerned about their engine and wanted to find out why he shouted the way he did. Sonny's driver cautiously walked to the front and came face to face with him. Sonny, what's wrong? Who are you shouting at back at the smelter's yard? 
You nearly caused your safety valve to burn a stole boy, his driver said. Is something bothering you? Sonny didn't reply for some time. At last, Sonny slept in a deep breath and let out a soft, almost silent sigh. A gentle but yet weak hiss of steam escaped from his cylinders. Some old, repressed memories came flooding back. He whispered, his voice slightly cracked. The voice I was shouting at, it was that man who threatened me with scrap if I didn't do what he asked me. I'm not useless. Sonny couldn't answer further as he held back a repressed sob. His driver gently patted him on the buffer. Sonny, that part of your life is over now. He can't hurt you no more. Sonny's driver said to his engine soothly, You're safe now. You're really useful. You've proven yourself to be a true asset to the Mats Railway. With that, Sonny's crew began to make their way home. They felt bad for leaving Sonny alone, but it was late, and they had families to get home to. Once the sound of footsteps walking along the ballast faded away, everything went quiet. Well, almost everything. For once, they were out of earshot. Sonny completely broke down. His lower <laughs> lip trembled as he sobbed quietly, tears streaming down his face over the never-ending rainfall. After what felt like an eternity had passed, Sonny managed to cry himself to sleep, though the horrors of that night would certainly become forgotten over time. Sonny knew deep down that his driver was right. He was no longer Baz's engine. Baz had no control over him anymore. Sonny had and would forever be free from his past as a thief, but in time, he would have no choice but to confront his demons so that he could truly let go of his past and move on.